is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 440. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas, where, Luis, you just got out of a uh, some, some type of sketchy escape room at Raptor's house or something? So the, it sounds weird if you if you uh, don't know what escape rooms are, but uh, <laughs> what it is is escape rooms, something I've actually talked about on the show before. You have like an hour to get out of a room full of puzzles, basically. And mm-hmm. uh, Raptor, Josh Utterleden, Magic Hall of Famer, Escape Room Hall of Famer as well, uh, actually built an escape room, like built is a little strong word. He just put, he, he just basically set up a bunch of different clues and used his uh, condo as kind of the staging ground for that. And so it took us an hour and eight minutes, but we did manage to escape eventually, which was good for our first first run of his room. Like he, he had some things he needed to work out and all that, but it was really cool. That's pretty cool. And I'm glad you made it out because now we get to do the show. Yay. And uh, this week we're covering the – we're highlighting our, our favorite archetypes from uh, Dominaria and we're doing a deep dive onto each of them to help explore exactly how these archetypes work, what to look what, what to look out for, some of the underrated cards and that kind of stuff for each of them. And then we're also going to talk about just some interactions, tips, tricks, that kind of stuff for Dominaria that we've encountered, um, maybe just unintuitive things that might not stand out to you. And we're going to go over those as well. First things first, though, the show is brought to you by ChannelFireball.com, the place to go on the internet for anything you need magic related. That's right. If you need uh, you know, sealed product, you want to buy a box of Dominaria, Channel Fireball, that's where you want to go. If you want to get some singles, they'll have them at Channel Fireball. Even if you need supplies, limited resources, sleeves and deck boxes to kind of show off your love of value, you can do that at Channel Fireball. And while you're there, check out some of the great free content right on the front page. Uh, Luis, you and I both have draft videos for Dominaria up on the site right now. So does Pascal Maynard. Uh, on the other side, in the written section, there's a whole bunch EDH set review by Rachel Agnes. Drafting with Siggy Dominaria, that, that's always a often, uh, you know, hotly awaited uh, article from Sigris because he's such a limited master and people want to get his thoughts. So you can do that right now over at CFB. And of course, all of that is free right on the front page of channelfireball.com. Please do check them out. Um, also, the show is brought to you by you. And this is uh, something I say on the show every time. I say it's by you, but it really is. It's by the listeners of this show via the Patreon. That is how this show has been able to grow and survive and stick around uh, is because of the Patreon. And of course, I'm always looking for ways to try to give back through the Patreon. So I've been doing a couple of things lately. I've got a couple of more things coming up as well. The last two, uh, the two things that I have done already are I've started posting um, pictures with like a brief description of decks that I managed to win a trophy with. And I just thought it would be a nice way to show you some of the things that have been successful for me and maybe use it as a little bit of a snapshot on what's going on and what type of decks are kind of floating to the top, at least as I play. Because, I mean, I'm playing all these drafts anyway. I figured we might as well get a little value. So that's on the Patreon feed. Because you're only posting the the trophy ones. You're not not really cluttering up the feed very often. (laughs) Yeah, I I could probably bring down the Patreon server (laughs) if I I posted them all. But but I figured the, the highlights were the ones that people would care about the most. And so if you're a patron, um, any level, you have access to the Patreon feed and you will you'll be able to see those. And then on top of that, and this is also goes for all of our patrons, I've started a Discord. And this is, uh, you know, a popular kind of uh, messaging slash voice over IP style service for gamers. And, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. But if you haven't, it's a kind of like a running chat room that you can have for any type of community or topic. And we've got one for limited resources now. And uh, if you're a patron, you're you can join it, I put a link in or you might have even been automatically added if you already have uh, discord, and you get some cool your names in different colors, depending on your patron level and all this kind of stuff. And we're probably going to have a, a patron only room on there as well. I, I'm still toying around with that. I, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what the demand is and how that goes. But anyway, this is a neat place where you can stay connected with other people like Luis and I, but also people that just are into limited and into value and into the podcast and that kind of stuff, like-minded people uh, throughout the course of the day, maybe throw them a question about, you know, hey, I had this draft pick, what should I have taken? Or what do you guys think about this card or whatever? Uh, We'll see where it goes. Uh, My take on these type of communities is always like, I love putting them out there. And if they fly, then they fly, but I'm not going to try to force it down your throat. If you're interested in it, you know where to find it. And uh, again, 
uh, you know, thanks to our patrons for helping uh, make that stuff happen as well. Now, one of the things you also get if you're a patron is you get uh, to submit questions for the Patreon question of the week. I just redid that one, uh, the thread for that. So if yours didn't get asked last time, throw it back in there. Uh, it's not because we didn't like it. It's just we only have so many questions that we get to answer. So this one comes from Steve who says, hi, Marshall and Luis. I'm a diehard basketball fan. I know you and I know you are, too. That is true. You like basketball quite a bit, right, Luis? I know you play. I, I do. Uh, I haven't yeah. been playing as much recently, which is a shame, but the weather's getting nice, so I might be back at it. Oh, there you go. And uh, Steve says, in fact, it seems like a lot of Magic players are. Is there something here? Both games are highly interactive and asymmetrical with a huge variety of strategies and feature combining synergistic players and pieces. Or maybe I'm overthinking this. Uh, and, and I think, Steve, no, it's probably not actually that big of a coincidence. Uh, basketball uh, does have some similarities to magic and mainly from the strategic standpoint of uh, exploiting weaknesses uh, from broad strategy of how you're going to put together the cards or in this case, the players that you're going to use before you actually put them onto the court uh, has a similar thing to like deck building where you're trying to find the best combination. And it's not always obvious. You might think in basketball, well, you just take the five best players that you have and put them out there, but that's not actually how it works out. There's a lot of matchup stuff and a lot of uh, things that affect the tempo and the pacing and the everything, how, how it all works. And you'll sometimes see a, a star player leave a team be replaced by somebody who plays differently than them, but not nearly as good. And somehow the team gets better. And uh, that, that is an effect that does happen in, in basketball sometimes, uh, even though you thought, well, this guy's a star. How, how could that have happened? Well, that's the kind of thing of, of synergy, right? Sometimes you, you, you pick in a, in a, uh, draft you sometimes you pick a deck that isn't you know it doesn't have the peak power level of another one but it's a wizard or it's a vampire or whatever and it goes better in your deck so i think there is actually quite a bit um there with the strategy plus basketball is just one of the most fun games to watch uh it's, it's fast paced and it's exciting and that kind of stuff too yes it, it, uh, does, he, it does not have that in common with magic no that that part is a lot different but i uh what i meant was uh that that's probably just why like a lot of people like basketball um he also says if the warriors rockets cavaliers and celtics were dominaria draft decks what decks would they be i got a couple of them yeah. answered and these are the four teams left i figure the Cavs would be like a bunch of junkers with lyra um yeah, the celtics <laughs> go ahead and one in an unbeatable bomb <laughs> An unbeatable bomb. The Celtics are uh, funny. They, they would be like a bunch of random draft chaff, like mid, like a bunch of C grade cards with a really great pilot and the best uh, the best cards in the sideboard. Um, but somehow still <laughs> the, the Warriors are, are if your, your colors are wide open and you just got hooked up. <laughs> just just yeah. Like after <laughs> in fact, the person yeah, you passing to you like doesn't doesn't even take the IC manipulator. They they just ship it. You know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you picked a gold card in both of your colors for open, and and, uh, and the Rockets. Uh, I guess that they're, they're uh, a, a team that uh, I don't know probably has two bombs in it and plays too many auras or something like that. But if, if they still have uh, Harden, it would be a, you know a, a team full of uh, a deck full of juggernauts just must attack every turn. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they do. So there you really go. Really bad at luck. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's all uh, Easter gliders or whatever. All right. Um, let's crack a pack here, Luis. Um, I've got this from Brian Nesbitt from uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. And uh, this is Rick Kleeman's friend. This is pretty funny. Anyway, let's. Uh, Rick is uh, th the guy that gave this to me is friends with the director of the Pro Tour like the behind the scenes director from the booth at the pro tour. So when I sit down and when Luis sits down with me on Sundays, sometimes to uh, broadcast, we have a voice in our ear, one of many, but the main voice in our ear is the, is the director telling us when we're live on the air, counting down different things, telling us where to go next, feeding us information. And that's Rick. And uh, one of Rick's friends actually came up and said, Hey, you know, Rick, I said, I do. And, uh, and he actually ended up giving me a pack here as well. So that's pretty cool. Let's get into it. Uh, first card is G2 journey mage two and a red three, two. And when it ETBs, if you control another wizard, it can, it does two damage to a player. Card's fine. Yeah, it's a fine card. I'm hoping not to first pick this. Definitely. Uh, invoke the divine. Sure. Yeah. The disenchant. Uh, I, I don't mind me mm -hmm. picking this, but I'm certainly not looking to first pick it. Yeah. Same. Uh, uh, Valdalian Arc Arc Arcanist. Uh, this is the one in a blue one three that is a wizard, and that actually comes up pretty often. It taps to add a colorless mana that you can only spend on instants or sorceries. Uh, I see this on the battlefield 
uh, I think a little more than I anticipated it to, and it seems to hold its own okay. It's like near the top of the random one threes, of which there are many in this set. Yeah, it's, it's a fine card. Yeah, not first picking it, though. Radiant Lightning, that's the three damage to a player, one damage to each creature they control. Fine sideboard card, but no. Wind Grace Acolyte, four and a black, three, two, flyer, mill yourself for three, gain three life. No, not first picking it. Pierce the Sky, that's the plummet of the set. We're not first picking that either. By the way, it's notably not plummet. It actually deals seven damage. I actually found myself in a situation where my opponent's creature was too big. <laughs> like, what the? Like, just give me a plummet, man. Um, Feral Abomination. <laughs> Five five card is an touch for six. Yeah, we're we're not first picking this. God, man, I've had to play that a couple of times recently, and it's not fun. Ugh. Uh, Corrosive ooze, another bad card. My God, uh, one and a green two two. And wind grace acolyte right now. Uh, all these yeah, cards. this is bad. All right, I am going to upgrade you, Luis, because our next card is absolutely first pickable. It's vicious offering. Yeah, this is a fine card. It's a one and a black. Give a creature minus two minus two at instant speed, and you can uh, pay kicker of sacking a creature and give the creature you targeted minus five minus five instead. Yeah. yeah, this is this Solid. is a fine first pickable removal spell. Like all, all the different removal spells that common are pretty close. There's like a, there's a range, and this is on the higher end of that range. Agreed. Yeah, uh, short sword, one mana for an equipment costs one to equip. Creature gets plus one plus one. It sees it sees some play, and I think it's not an unplayable card. But you know, I got to tell you, I've never really been happy with it. Uh, its impact is just enough so that you're not embarrassed. But I, I just. I never want it's like I like fun. the joust a lot. Better. Yes, jousting mm -hmm. jousting lance is much better. Yeah, that one actually has a, a good long term effect. Oh goodness sakes! How about uh, our first uncommon is very similar to vicious offering. Cast down. That's right. Yeah, this is one of the black to uh, kill a non legendary creature at instant speed. I like this more than vicious offering. It it, it doesn't kill everything you want to kill, but it's cheap and it's effect, you know it's effective. So I think it's it is better overall. Yeah, me too. That's what I'm. That's where I'm at. Uh, next one is Memorial to War. This is the red land. It's the worst of the cycle. I don't think it's really playable. It's the one that destroys the land for four and red and sack it. Um, oh, here's Ryan's card, the one that he uh, designed. The first eruption. It's also the first one out of the pack because we're not taking it. Um, but this is the one that does one damage to each creature without flying and then adds double red. This is a, a saga, of course. And then uh, at the end, you sack a mountain and it does three damage to each creature. Uh, sideboard at best, although I, I admit I've never actually seen it on the yeah, battlefield. I don't think it's particularly good, and I think it's a pretty easy cast down here. One thing I do want to know: we, we 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 do have a uh, our oh legend, yeah, though. yeah, and it's a nice. Is, is it better? <sighs> yeah, I actually do think it's a better card. Yes, uh, but it, it, it's gold, so I don't know if we want to do it. It's Raf Capuchin ships. Oh yeah, I would take. I would. Oh, You're going to slam down. Raph over Cast. I think right now I probably would, but my guess is that Cast mm -hmm. Down is actually better. I just want to play with Raph Caption a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I played against Raph a bunch of times. All right. Well, I would still take Cast Down. I think, like, I would want to take Raph, and that is likely uh, what I would do if I was just like drafting online. But if I think if you want to win, but, but it's Friday at the Pro Tour. Yeah, I'm taking, I'm taking you're, Cast you're Down. Single color, and I, I think. Slightly worse. I, I think 3-3 three, three Flash, that gives a bunch of your cards Flash, that is also a legend for all the things that matter, is a little better, but not by much. Uh, I, I mean, you know, you know how I make these decisions. The head-to-head. -head. Can't kill Raph with Put him in the arena. Can't kill it, so Raph it is. Windmill Slam. <laughs> I'm taking it. <laughs> I also wanted to bring up what, what were you going to say? That, uh, mm -hmm. got, yeah. you know, so got into this conversation on Twitter where uh, – a pretty frequent thing people go back to is like, let's say Raph wasn't in the pack, right? We had this, the same pack minus Raph. Yeah. If we took cast down, we could basically guarantee the person to our left would take vicious offering. And, and yes. does that make us want to take something else instead? And the answer is almost always no. You, you really just should not be worried about what the couple people to your left are taking. Like, yes, in a perfect world, if there's an exact tie, then maybe that's a tiebreaker. But for the most part, like, you're more concerned about picking up the signals from the person on your right than you are on what signals you're giving to the person on your left. Because, you know, I've had drafts where I pass Adelie's the Cinder Wind, right? The blue red gold card. Take something else, take something else. And then third pick, there's another Adelie's. At that point, I'm probably going to take her because that is a really good signal that blue red Wizards is open and she's great. The fact that the yeah. person on my left might be drafting it, it just does not enter into the calculation to a great degree. And in fact, the degree is small enough that for most people who are wondering this or are worried about this, they're better served for now by not calculating it at all. Like just mm -hmm. ignoring it completely because this is how you get people taking like 
you know, vicious offering over Sarah Angel because the pack also has like a blinding light and a night of grace. And exactly. And, yes. And you, you're not doing yourself a, a service there. So, yeah. And th this is one of the biggest skills that you can learn to, and, and it's not, it's, I'm not talking about specifically what Luis is saying, but it's the ability to apply concepts, right? Th th this is where you can really screw yourself up because like people like us, you know, people that draft a whole lot, we like to concentrate on the minutia, right? Because like once you kind of understand the big picture pieces, some of the more interesting and, and some of the things that actually change your mind are the exceptions. And those are things like this where, where like it's fun if you understand everything that's going on to say, oh, there's actually a tiebreaker here. I'm going to take the card that I'm not passing to my left to improve my chances of getting a slightly better second pack. But if you really understand the concept, you know – that in order for that to come back as like a real return to you, a lot of things have to go in, in a certain direction where the player has to pick up on that. And let's just say they don't care and they just pass it. It's like there's a whole lot that could go wrong and that at best it's a tiebreaker. But it's when you understand the concept but not the weight of it that you really can screw yourself up. And again, I think that it's something that people should really be mindful of in practice is, ap is applying concepts in games and in life as well and understanding the weight that each one carries. Because this is a real concept. It just doesn't carry that much weight. Exactly. So just a, a kind of a side note while we got into the Cracker Pack. But – All uh, right. So let's get into yeah, the – yeah, so it was kind of cool because you sent me an email earlier in the week and you had highlighted your five favorite archetypes and they lined up exactly with the ones that I want to be in as well. So I was like, great, we're going to hammer these ones because these are what uh, I've been doing well with. I mean, I get, the last trophy I got was actually red white, which isn't on here. And I don't really like it that much. I, I'll i be honest with you, Luis. I think I just got a little lucky. Like Honestly, my deck like wasn't that great. Red white and, the, over the last bunch of formats has always felt to me like the deck where mm – -hmm. If you draw six lands and the rest are spells, like you'll probably win, but it doesn't have a lot of control over that and not a great plan when you flood out. Yeah, exactly. And and this felt that way. I mean, I don't know. I had the whatever the uncommon what what's her name? I don't remember. But Tiana Ship's Caretaker. Yeah, that's the one. And the card's fine, mm -hmm. right? It's not great. Like it it doesn't it, you know, none of these you know, some of the gold cards really, you know, uh, we we just had Raf Capuchin in our deck. I mean, that card's good like that thing will eat a creature and then let you you know really wreak havoc and it hits hard in the air and it's like aggressively i mean there's a lot to like you know with slime foot the stowaway you know this is a card that can really dominate the late part you know the extreme late game and i don't know tiana doesn't do those things and that's just kind of like stage one and then and especially when uh in fact before l l before we get into this one i have to ask you about the red white deck have you how often do you encounter not just a red white archetype, but one that's actually trying to do the thing that red white is the, proposing the, the to do. Or as an equipment thing. Yeah. The thing is, I don't even think that's the best auras deck because Arcane Flight is is a much more effective aura <laughs> than all <laughs> yeah, the rest. Uh, then, then so or I, I played against aggressive red white decks and played with them, but they don't usually seem like they're leaning too heavily on the auras theme. Like sometimes they'll have yeah. Val Duke, the three two that you know yep. makes you a three one for every aura equipment on it and. Yeah, that, that does end up working out fine for the deck. But for the most part, it's just kind of a red-white curve beatdown deck that sometimes will play a Sarah Angel in five and sometimes won't, I guess. Yeah, that's kind of been my take. Okay, let's get back to our, our uh, the ones that we actually want to talk about, though. The first one I wanted to bring up, green, black, I called it Sacralings, but whatever. The Sacrifice slash Sacralings slash Go I just wide. assumed that was a typo. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's that was just cleverness pouring out onto the screen. So this is like a grindy tokens kind of deck that takes advantage of um, multiple creatures from single cards, right? Uh, Yavamaya Sap Herd and Sapperly Migration, like these cards that give you multiple bodies out of one card, plus mixing that. And often th these are from that Sapperling slash Fungus payoffs to either overwhelm the board and attack, which is one way that you can win with this, or on the other end of the spectrum completely, grind the game to a crushing halt and generate this like long-term advantage. It is funny because I would say about three quarters of the time, I'm in that second camp, the one where I'm trying to kind of grind things out. But you do have these draws where you just put like a whole bunch of creatures on the battlefield, pump them up and just overwhelm your opponent occasionally too, which is weird because those aren't, I don't, I don't really associate those two things together. No, this, I mean, it's not an aggro deck, but yeah, it is capable of curving out. Yeah. And 
it's got some draws, especially ones involving an Elfheim Druid that taps for two green for kickers, where you're just like oh, yeah. migrationing on turn four and then casting Wild Onslaught kicked on, on turn six, or, and that's without having any other any other help. So yeah. the, the deck can, can go pretty wide. Um, one of the things I, I want to note about the deck, and one of the reasons I, I like it a lot, is that it, it gets to splash off of from mm. the ashes or grow from the ashes mainly, but also you know it likes a skittering surreal just like everyone else. And sometimes you can play Lenore or Envoy the three two that filters mana, and the deck is poised to take advantage of you know off color Sheevan fires or uh, like Tatiova the blue green legend or even things like Blessed Light or Shalai. Like it just gets to play these cards, and one of the the advantages that comes with that in this format in particular is there's just tons of really powerful cards and you don't always get to play them. Like I started a draft yesterday with um, Blessed Light, Eviscerate, Adelie's the Cinderwind. Like those are my first three picks. Okay, a little awkward. Just ended up straight blue-red wizards, you know, but it it just so Mm -hmm. happens there's just a lot of powerful cards and you're not, you're frequently not going to be able to play all of them. So yeah, that happens. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty big advantage to be able to to do to be able to do so, and th- this deck does it at yeah. a higher rate than most decks. It does. You mentioned the the spells that can fix the mana, but on top of it, it's again I, I consider it its baseline game plan of having the game go really long also makes it more likely that you'll find the time needed to find those lands and stuff too because it just goes with your plan. You know, control decks generally can splash a little better uh, given that they're trying to get to turn twelve or fourteen or whatever. Where if you're an aggro deck and you're trying to splash, it's kind of like you just have to draw that splash at the right time or else you're sitting there falling behind. Some of the key commons. For this are uh, Death Bloom Thalid, a card that I've been really impressed with. I just you'll actually see that one come up multiple times because it's just such a solid card in so many different types of decks. But here it's really good. Uh, it's a fungus; it replaces itself with a Sapperling, so it's just hard to get rid of, and you can maintain a board presence. Um, we mentioned Sapperling Migration; that's the one in a green make two. One one saps, or you can kick it for another four and get four of them. Yavamaya sap herd, the two two fungus that brings along a, a one one, and then to a to a lesser degree though, this is kind of the deck that wants it is Thalid Omnivore, and that's the the one that's uh, a three three for four, and you can pay a man and sack a creature to give it plus two plus two, and if it was a Thalid, then you uh, you gain two life as well. Um, the payoffs, right, for having all of these little creatures. Um, the most explosive one and the stupid draws are always Song of Fraley's because this is the deck. Yeah, that, it's one of the best uncommon like where you in the never set, and this is it. the deck you, that uses yeah. it by far the best. Exactly. And you just cr- – it is so disgusting uh, when you get to go off. Less so, um, but still you mentioned it a minute ago, Wild Onslaught, the three and a green, put a plus one, plus one counter on each of your creatures at instant yeah, speed and you can take it Song of Fraley's, so I guess it costs more also, yeah. so – yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so it's worse, but costs more. It's like, you know, we're, we're bad consumers. But still, this is a way that you can leverage having five, six, seven, you know, one ones on the battlefield. And then another really good one is Spore Crown Thalid. That's a one in a green that gives plus one, uh, two, two, that gives uh, plus one, plus one to all your uh, funguses and uh, sapperlings as well. So those are kind of your primary payoffs for the whole go wide thing. Um, but again, the the main way that you win is that this thing becomes like a full on grind fest, and it includes Slimefoot the Stowaway, which we talked about. Um, you know, this is one of the key cards because it gives you a steady stream of creatures and also kind of punishes your opponent for attacking or blocking, or if you can get sacrifice outlets going, like Thalid Omnivore that I mentioned, or Thalid Soothsayer. You know, that one's the one where you can sack a creature to draw a card. And if you can get that rolling with Slimefoot, you know, if you get enough mana rolling and uh, like Louis said, you actually do play some mana ramp in this deck as well, then you can get a card advantage uh, engine going, especially if you get fungal plots going that lets you sack two sapperlings to gain two life and draw a card. You don't actually need to have that much going on in the graveyard if you can generate a bunch with like Slimefoot the Stowaway or whatever. And you can get a real engine rolling where your opponent's losing a lot of life you're gaining life and you're drawing cards and uh, you're, you're not even having to attack at that point because, again, you're trying to uh, gum up the ground game. And this deck's really, really good at doing that. Um, one thing that it can have a weakness to, though, are flyers. Uh, you've got Mammoth Spider and you've got Pierce the Sky uh, besides your normal removal spells. But 
those are about the only ones that really, you know, that you can really like rely on to make sure that you don't die to flyers because you have to use removal on other stuff sometimes. And again, since it really does do a great job of gumming up the ground, make sure that you're patient with your removal and you don't just lose to like a random 3-2 flyer uh, because you got a little bit too frisky, you know, with your eviscerate or whatever and killed something. Yeah, I also want to note that a uh, phallid omnivore is your kind of a backstop against flyers just because it can start eating saplings and gaining two life and and Very you can true. win the race. I, I, you know, you've got a section later of cards you should be valuing higher, and that little owner was one I would add to that list. Okay, yeah. So we'll we'll put that one on there uh, just to break down how the deck goes, just really quickly. I run seventeen lands in these decks. Sometimes sixteen if I have like like uh, Llanowar Elves and uh, Elfham Druid or something, but usually seventeen. Um, this is a creature deck. 12 to 15 creatures is is where you want to be, but you you have to remember that creatures also count cards like Sapperling, Mig- Migration, and Spore Swarm. Like, I'm counting those yeah, as creatures in here. count as creatures. I, I think that when you yeah. when you sort them, they should just be in your creature pile. It doesn't. There's no real reason not yeah. to do that. Exactly. Um, I don't play combat tricks in this deck. I just don't. There, there's the none that I really you want. You Fungal Infection. Yeah, fun- yeah, and I consider that a removal spell. I mean, I'm not saying if you put a Gift of Growth in this deck, it would be a disaster. But I'm it, just saying it's not a priority. It would be a disaster. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> and then, of course, you want the good black removal. And I have noticed also that Ancient Animus doesn't perform particularly well here. Um, you do end up with a bunch of small uh, to medium-sized creatures and less of the really big ones, though sometimes your deck will give that to you and, and go ahead and run it. Um, and then last but not least, cards that you should be valuing higher for this archetype. So you mentioned the uh, Thalid Omnivores on your list. Yeah, it, you you know, it, this list is basically just all the Thalids. Uh, Thalid Omnivore, mm-hmm. uh, Spork on Thalid, Thalid Soothsayer, Wild Onslaught, uh, and Fungal Plots. So yeah, these these are basically cards that you don't want in other archetypes is kind of how I see it. Like, look, obviously you're going to value your removal spells, your bombs, your big, you know, it, it, it's the cards, the ones that we want to highlight for this section are ones that are specifically good in this deck that aren't really, like Spore Crown Thalad in a not Thalad's deck is fine, but, you know, you, you would take any removal spell over it. Or the one whatever. reason I think that Omnivore should be valued, valued a little higher is I found that card to be effective in other decks as well. It's just a powerful card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so too. And so you need to, to make sure you do it. Um, all right, so that's it for for green black. Next one is white black. Th- I don't really have an archetype name for this. I just called it stuff. Um, like I, I, I think. I, do you do you have a theme that you see? Is there a? I, I, I believe this historic? qualifies as historic. I I think okay. that uh, a lot of the like there's white black decks that are similar to what you describe here. Were just like you know good removal spells and a decent decent curve of creatures, but. The white black decks that lean on Cabal Paladin, you know, the 4 2 that pings them for two, and then um, the Davenant Trapper, the 3 2 that taps a creature, th- mm-hmm. those are real decks, and I do think that they can end up uh, playing out pretty nicely. Okay. Well, the one that I'm focused, like the way that I've been drafting it is like this is basically the deck that has access to the best removal in the set and also tends to have access to the best bombs like the highest upside you know insane bombs tend to be in these two colors as well not that there's not in others but boy the peak on the removal and the bombs in in this archetype is very very high i think that uh you know it if you were to ask me what color pair would i like it like a sealed deck for a gp or something and and you told me you're going to get a really good version i would definitely say white black just cuz like really good version just can't like the the bombs are so insane up top. And then, you know, I'm going to have some combination of really good removal spells here. And it turns out the filler stuff is actually pretty good too. Um, you know, the, the archetype doesn't have a ton of synergy. I think you highlighted like the most synergistic that it can be. And, and even um, then it's like mm-hmm. about four of the creatures that care about historic and like maybe one mm-hmm. or two cards you wouldn't have played otherwise. Like maybe a uh, random like Partic, uh, five five trample partic sentinel partic w- one wander, wander yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. sneaks its way in but for the most part uh you're you're not in a position where you're you're not playing sparring construct very often you know you're not you're not you're not going right. quite that far you're just playing your short sword and jousting lance that you would have already played and like I said maybe one thing gets in that wouldn't have otherwise but this is still not a very strong synergy deck. 
Yeah, it's low on synergy. And, you know, so what that means is, of course, is that it, it really has to stand on the strength of its cards. But the good news is it has some pretty darn strong cards. So that's pretty good. Now, for the key commons, normally I don't reference removal here very much because um, unless the removal is specific to the deck, but like unconditional or just good removal, you know, as a listener, that that's stuff that you need to go get. But the crazy part about this this color pair is that the removal is so good. You get Blessed Light. Eviscerate, Vicious Offering, Fungal Infection, and Gideon's Reproach. Yeah, all at common. At common. Like, th those are the commons. And there's really nice uncommons in here, too, with, like, uh, what, what's it called? Uh, seal, seal Away and the card okay, that we cast, open, the Cast Down. down and settle stuff. the score. I mean, settle the score. It's just stupid. And so you get this absurd removal. Um, and to me, you know, one of the things that, uh, you kind of brought to the table when we were doing these archetypes, Luis, was how do I get into this deck, right? Like, how does that start? And to me, I think that's it. Like you either open a bomb or a removal spell in these colors and you're like, oh, I'll first pick Eviscerate. You, you know? first pick Eviscerate, you second pick like another like decent black card. And then mm -hmm. third pick, you're just like, you know, even Sentry, 3-2 three, three, Flyer, fourth pick, Blessed Light. And all of a sudden you're like, hmm, a Flyer and a couple of removal spells. I, I guess I'm in. Yeah, and that's it. Or you get lucky and you open, you know, Bells and Lock or Lyra or Shalai or just some of these, you know, really good rares or mythic rares. And you're just like, I'm playing this, right? And you fill it in with whatever, you know, you, you get handed. Um, again, and I think it's because you open the bombs or removal that gets you there in many, in many times. I, I think that this deck can lean, like I said, synergistic with the historic stuff. And this is one of the few decks where uh, Chainer's Torment that, Saga might be playable if you're tapping a creature when you cast it and you're already the aggressive deck or you have a Cabal Paladin in play. Like, that's not the end of the world. But for mm -hmm. the most part, this is going to play closest to a, you know, quote, normal limited deck than I think everything else, but maybe the maybe the blue-white deck, which is what we're going to talk about next. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, the some of the notes I had on this were like, so it's because of the bombs or removal that you end up getting into this deck. If it happened to be the bombs, if you got some of those really sweet high-end cards, you'll probably want to prioritize a way to buy them back at some point since your deck tends to uh, lend itself to the late game. And it's very common to have your opponent kill your bomb the first time you cast it. You're like, shall I? And they're like, sure, kill it. Right? That happens all the time. So make sure you grab a Soul Salvage or a Memorial to Folly or something like that so that you have a way to really grind them out because the second time you cast one of, you know, a, a Shalai or a Lyra or whatever, it's over. Like, it is so difficult to overcome cards of that quality multiple times. And these cards are just fine on their own anyway, Soul Salvage and, and that I kind of stuff. I thought you meant like a so Lyra it, and Shalai because, yeah, those, those, those yeah. are <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're okay on their own. Um, again, 17 lands is what I've been playing here. A pretty typical creature curve of 12 to 15 creatures. Here I will play some combat tricks, um, though I'm not prioritizing them. Adamant Will has been a, a fine one for me. It seems to perform okay, but y if you don't end up with them, that's fine. You play all the damn removal, right? Okay. This, right we, we mentioned those. Uh, you know, This is why you're here. Prioritize it and play it all. And then uh, some of the cards that came to mind that you might – not be thinking about for this type of archetype, Deathbloom Thalid. I know it sounds a little weird, but that card is just good. It's just a very good magic card. It doesn't need to say Thalid on it or surprise. I think if if the spiraling deck yeah. wasn't in the format, people might think this card is better because it just looks so good. You know, if you're just evaluating yeah. on its own merits. But yes, I, I think what you're, you're trying to fight against is people thinking like, "Oh, I'm not the spiraling deck. Do I really want this card?" And the answer is yes. The card is the card. That's right. That's right. That's exactly what I was thinking. One of my favorites is uh, Caligo Skin Witch. That's the the one and a three. Look, as a one three, you can cast it and not not die. Ideally, like in the early part of the game. But boy, if you have that thing late, it can knock out those last two spells from your opponent's hand, and it can be really devastating. I like that flexibility. And then don't forget. Uh, invoke the divine it's okay to main deck one if you don't that's okay it can be in the sideboard but you really do want to have access to it there's some insane equipment and some creatures and stuff you know like juggernaut and that kind of thing that you can snap off with invoke the divine so you're going to want to have access to that too okay you just mentioned it let's talk about um blue white historic flyers this is uh closest to one of the you know traditional archetypes blue white plays with flyers or has played with flyers in almost every single set it does have the mm -hmm. additional historic aspect to it, which is mostly in Relic Seeker, but uh, there's also a, a variety of other smaller payoffs, Sarah Disciple or, uh, you know, the assist, the Artificer's Assistant. 
And mm -hmm. w what you're going to end up doing in this deck is just getting all the evasive creatures that you can and then the removal or bounce spells and just trying to kill your opponent, hopefully in, in a spot where they can't really fight back all that well. That's right. Some of the key comments here are uh, Pegasus Courser is an absolute key. That card is... It's a problem. Okay, this is the right? one that, that, that thing. Uh, when it attacks, gives another attacking creature flying. And th this is a card that plays defense okay. And then when it's time to attack the opponent, all of a sudden your uh, Academy Journey Mage, the 3 2 that bounced a creature, is just clocking them in the air. And totally. it's really dangerous. It's so brutal. I, don't, yeah, don't fall yeah. into the trap of thinking, well, this is a blue white flyers deck. All my creatures fly. Courser is still quite good in this deck. Definitely. And, and it makes it so that actually all of your creatures fly. Uh, Academy Drake is your go-to bread and butter card here. Three mana, two, three flying. Great. Later in the game, it can become two, a four-four four four flyer yeah. if you draw it. A uh, two-two flying. Thank you. Yeah. And then later it can be a four-four. Good. Um, Academy Journey Mage you mentioned. Look, that is the type of card that you want here. It knocks your opponent off balance, sends them back on tempo, and continues to develop your board, it, even in just a defensive way where it can trade off or block. That's really good. And then, like you said, if you get it up in the air with Pegasus Courser, forget it. Uh, blink, in the, uh, blink of an Eye works really well in this deck. You just usually need to buy yourself an extra turn um, of attacks in the air. And Blink of an Eye, especially kicked, means that you're not even losing card advantage. And, and if you sometimes you just play it without kicker two and you can still win. Um, even Sentry, another bread and butter, 3-2 flyer for four. Cloud Reader Sphinx is really your top end and, and one of your best cards. It fuels you through the mid to late game by scrying away unwanted cards or lands and making sure that you can get to where you need to get. But it is a very legitimate attacker slash blocker at 3-4. With flying, this card has not disappointed you and I are both really stoked oh, yeah, when we saw it. And great. boy, it's been great. And then the last one is uh, this is really the best place for Deep Freeze. Oh, by far. Deep Freeze is a really powerful removal spell if you're in a position to use it. And this is the deck that actually gets to do it and not, not feel guilty about it because it's just trying to fly over. So it doesn't care about the, the creature you froze out. Yeah. Um, so the way that this plays out is it's a classic tempo slash flyers deck that looks to get an air force of, say, four to five power, you know, maybe a turn three Drake into a turn four Aven Sentry will do nicely. Now you've got five power up. And if your opponent doesn't kill it, then you protect that game plan while racing in the air against the opponent. All you do is just make sure your creatures don't die and make sure that they don't just completely go off. And the key is that you don't even need to kill every creature your opponent plays. You just need to delay them long enough uh, so that they can't kill you while you're clocking them in the air. And that clock ends up being very quick. So this highlights short-term gain cards like Blink of an Eye that I mentioned and Ed Uncommon, Time of Ice card I like a lot. This is, again, the absolute best home for time of ice making them absolute all-stars academy journey mage i mentioned is similar uh, in that way uh and of, and of course deep freeze um again pegasus courser is a card that you really want to value highly in these decks they go quickly other decks want them and it's still really good even in the flyer stack this is another 17 land deck uh another traditional curve out mid-range type deck with 12 to 15 creatures now you can play more combat tricks here if you'd like um, they can help save your creatures from removal, you know, from Gideon's Reproach or that kind of thing. Or sometimes you do end up attacking on the ground if your opponent's trying to race. Um, one of the interesting things is that, well, removal is still good, right? Of course, you're going to take removal. The gap between it and temporary measures, like the cards we mentioned, uh, like Blink of an Eye and Academy Journey Mage, is actually uh, a bit smaller here than it normally would be. You can often win the game by playing those type of cards where if you're playing blue black control and your plan is to blink of an eye your opponent out well that that's not really going to work for a, a long-term plan you're going to have to deal with that threat at some point anyway um cards you should be valuing higher for this archetype time of ice blink of an eye deep freeze we mentioned those and then pegasus courser and then if you want you can play um dominant trapper it's okay in this deck like you do end up playing a little bit of equipment a little bit of stuff and it can get yeah. you like one extra hit it's, um, it, it's fine, fine, but uh, I'd rather have Pegasus Courser when it comes to getting my creatures through. Definitely. All right. Uh, next one is Blue Red Wizards. Maybe the best deck in the format when it comes together. Uh, this is certainly the most synergistic is, deck of, of the world. Yeah, and, and, and when this deck does come together, and you'll play against it sometimes and feel like you were never in the game. Like, f feel mm -hmm. like you never had a chance. Definitely. So uh, what this deck is trying to do is combine wizards. This, this is the only actually supported tribe, you know, sorry, sorry goblins. Mm -hmm. um, and 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And combine those wizards with cheap removal and cheap tempo plays and just spells in general, because you have a couple different rewards going on. You have, well, wizards that care about having more wizards. You have wizards that care about you casting spells, and then you have spells that naturally lend themselves to, to a tempo deck. So mm -hmm. the deck is brutal and result revolves pretty strongly around Adelise the Cinderwind. We mentioned her earlier. She is the reason you would want to play this deck. Like she encapsulates what this deck is trying to do perfectly. Yeah, on both axes, right? Like, she rewards your wizards for casting spells. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, and, and I get she's it. she's a, you know, a 2-2 a, a two -two flying haste for three, which this deck could also be just a fan of. And if you untap with Adelaide, mm -hmm. you often win with this deck. But even at common, the deck has some yeah. good support. It has Academy Journey Mage, the 3-2 Bounce. G2 Chronicler. Which is often four, which is often four often mana, four mana by the way. You're, you're actually uh, G2 Chronicler, yep. which you're okay casting for two more in this deck than others. And then uh, way more often. G2 Journey Mage, a 3-2 that deals two to your opponent. And these wizards plus the spells really do get you to a place where you can effectively pressure the opponent. Uh, G2 Lava Runner is a, is a kind of surprisingly good card in this deck. Mm -hmm. And... It, it is the, a card that really rewards you for playing like Ops and uh, Warlord's Fury or, or whatever the uh, red give all your creatures first strike. I think that's Warlord's Fury. Yeah, and, it is. And yeah. You, you can end up in a spot where you get to play like 16 lands, sometimes even less, because you have a bunch of uh, cantrips in your deck. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, and, and as you kind of touched on there, you can actually stretch the boundaries on what you think of a playable creature is by a little bit. Um, sure, you want your Adelise to cinder win. She's fantastic. But she also pays you off for paying for playing some of those cards like you mentioned, and also cards like Talarian Scholar and Valdalian, um Arcanist. Those are both wizards. They're two mana and three mana. And, you know, th they all get pumped up by Adelise as well. So that's a really good thing. Um, and you'll note that the kind of overall game plan is similar to a lot of blue red decks of the past where you're getting incidental damage. We call it chip damage. You know, you're like pecking in here for a damage or, you know, damage or two here or there. Uh, then, you know, Oh, you played a Gitu journey mage and it's like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm down to 14 and then it's like, boom, here's Adelise and, and you're taking six and it's like, wow, I, I am almost dead. Like, how did this even happen? Right. I don't have any good blocks and all this stuff is going on. And uh, maybe you you set up a huge Adelise field attack with, you know, a couple of, of instants or sorceries or whatever. Um, one of the other cards that I really like in this deck, uh, it's obvious when you play against it, but boy, Fire Fist Adept is another payoff for playing these subpar cards like the Arcanist and the Talarian Scholar. But man, you turn that thing into a full on, you know, nuke a creature when yeah, it enters the battlefield. And three, three pings for one for each uh, wizard you control. Yeah, you can, you know, if you have three of them, it counts itself, you know, you can you can kill a, a three toughness creature, for example. And that is just a solid two for one that's really hard to come back from, especially when you consider that the Fire Fist Adept is a wizard itself. So it's going to get pumped and do all these other things. This deck can also um, run Syncopate kind of nicely. Oh, OK. Because yeah, sure. it's got some fairly cheap cards. You also can run plays like end of turn, blink of an eye, your creature, and then keep up Syncopate on your next turn or... Uh, use an mm -hmm. Academy Journey Mage on something expensive and hope you can syncopate it like for two. Because, so, mm -hmm. it, and it's a spell that adds to all the spell counts for all the cards that care about that. So it, it's something to keep in mind, which syncopate's a fine card. It's not like I expect to get them 12 pick, but they, it's a card you can usually pick one or two of up. And I just want to note that this aggressive deck actually is in a position to make use of it, which not all aggressive decks would be. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen people try to set up like a big Adelie's turn where they like play a thing, syncopate for zero, you know, just like, oh, no, you know, they're going to play three spells this turn and then just kill me. Um, Naru Meha is fine. That's the two blue, blue, uh, three, three that pumps all your wizards. You absolutely want that card in your deck, though. You almost never get to actually use the enter the battlefield effect. Fair enough. Doesn't matter. It still pumps all your uh, Wizards, Nabon is okay too. Like if you trigger those journey mages twice, it feels pretty broken. Like bouncing two things or taking four damage is, is a big difference and he's not really a downside. Um, card type breakdown, 16 or 17 lands. Um, similar, you want 12 to 15 creatures. You want as many wizards as you can get to a point. Like you got to make sure you have the payoffs. Like you don't get paid off just for simply having wizards. You do need to have um, 
you know, the Adelies is, is the key, but also you can have uh, things like the um, Fire Fist Adept that we mentioned. And if you get those, you will dip down into the kind of anything that says wizard on it. And then you can take advantage of the good red removal and the blue tempo spells. Also, the cheap combat tricks are fine here too. Um, you know, triggering Adelies is great. And uh, like you said, you can also buy them back a lot and and try to get value from them. Um, by using your Gitu Chronicler on like a cheap card can be kind of cool as well. Um, cards that you maybe should value a little bit higher for this type of archetype. Well, they're the cards that say wizard on them that you wouldn't normally want to play like the Voldalian Arcanist, like Tal Talarian Scholar. Um, and then of course you want your Fire Fist Adepts and Adelies is where in other decks, those cards are mediocre, like Fire Fist Adept on its own, still ping something for one, but eh. And Adelies is still fine if you can cast it. But in this archetype, you know, this is where they're through the roof. Like you'll take them over removal spells. So that's it. Uh, one more um, archetype to break down. It is Blue Black Control. This is a deck that uh, it uses bombs the best, uh, mainly because it finds them with cards like Divination and uh, Dark Bargain, and then it has like Rona and Soul Salvage to, to buy them back. This is there, There's some pretty nasty loops you can actually get, get, get into here, but it is also the deck that is dependent on its best cards the most. It, so Blue Black is, is trying to control the game, kill your opponent's creatures, finish you with you know a, a small selection of finishers, and it leans on card quality pretty highly. It's not particularly high on synergy. It's looking to just cast cards like, you know, Cloud Reader Sphinx and Death Bloom Salad and uh, Thalad and Divination alongside removal spells and just kind of win old fashioned magic that way. Yeah, it's a really classic mix of removal, permission, and card draw. And it just powers you through to the late game, assuming that you can survive that long. Um, you know, Soul Salvage for. Card advantage, syncopate, you know, counter your stuff. Cold water snapper is your sort of fill in bomb, like the card that you didn't really want to run, but eh, it's hard to kill and, and, and it can get the job done. Um, uh, something to note here, of course, is that this is a true control deck. So you're going to want to prioritize permanent solutions to problems with possible. Look, you can run an Academy Journey Major of a, or a Blink of an Eye in a deck like this. It, it's not like it hurts you, but. If you're really looking to push the game long, those don't solve the problem of whatever bomb they cast. So Eviscerate or Vicious Offering or whatever is really where you want to be with these. Um, the key to the archetype is that it needs balance. You have to have enough defensive speed to not die to a relatively quick start, but you need enough late game punch to win when you get to that part of the game so you're not going toe-to-toe -to -toe with your opponent's mediocre stuff. And the key, of course, is in between where you're going to have to balance you know, when to cast your divinations or dark bargains versus when to use your removal spells or develop out your board. Um, you also will prefer resilient game-winning threats over more powerful but less reliable win cons. And that's, again, where, where cards like the Cold Water Snapper come in. You know, you can combine it with some, uh, maybe an aura or something like that and, and win the game Cold that Water way. Cold Water Snapper just this, stops your opponent's offense completely by itself. You don't even need it. I know. I feel like I want a Cold cold Water Snapper just holding up a stop <laughs> sign. He's just like, no. Or maybe we should just call him the speed bump. There you go. Um so card types, uh, 17 or 18 lands, that happens here too. You got a lot of card draw. You lower on creatures here, you know, 10 creatures, 11, maybe 12. Like you don't need to have the, you know, you don't need to get up into the 15, 16, 17 range necessarily. Uh, zero combat tricks. They, they basically don't apply to a deck like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do want two to three card draw spells, which is actually quite a bit. Um, and the, like Wait I said, those memory, can come in the form of uh, Dark Bargain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. e yep. Oh, it is worth noting when we look at like how you get into this deck, and the most common reason I do is a good uncommon like like Rona in Bolus's clutches, the Eldest Reborn. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. if if I start with like a good black card, and then I see a Cloud Reader Sphinx or a Blink of an Eye or Divination, I'm like leaning towards playing this deck. But the key is starting with a powerful card because you can you can win with like a Sapperling deck or a Red White Aggro deck or even a Blue White Tempo deck without having really any headliners, th these blue-black control decks do tend to need something on the high end. It, it's really hard to beat someone with just a bunch of eviscerates and divinations because you, you need a, an actual powerful way to close out the game and, and get ahead when you're just playing normal magic because you're so low on mm -hmm. synergy. Like the, These decks are you know, at like a 2 out of 10 on the synergy scale most of the time. 
Yeah, they really are. Some of the cards you should be valuing higher for this type of deck. Uh, Wind Grace Acolyte does okay. You get the life gain, which is nice because sometimes you can fall a little bit behind. Plus, you get like Soul Salvage and Rona Synergies by milling yourself for three. Uh, the Death Bloom Thal we talked about, again, just good value. Fungal Infection does a lot of work in this deck because it's so cheap. It actually kills some threats and then uh, can take care of like any type of early rush from your opponent's like first play of the game in most cases. Um, the Colago Skin Witch I mentioned, really good flexible blocker early, and it's a late game. It's just a hammer. I love this card. It just it just knocks out your opponent's stuff. And then, like Louise said, you know, you, if you're really going to have a great version of this deck, you're going to have something insane, um, you know, up top to make sure that you can uh, you can get them. Joe Suves, anybody? Oh yeah, I, I have that's seen a, a lot of armies of uh, Lich Knights there. Uh, it turns Definitely. out kicking Joe Suves is is not out of the question in this format. No, it can happen. And this is the type of deck that can do it. Okay, let's kind of rapid fire through these. I just uh, picked a whole bunch of uh, tips, tricks, uh, interactions, yeah, little things to remember for the format. In this, Yeah. So let's start off with our kind of headliner, uh, or one of them is uh, Traxos. That's the 7-7 seven, seven Trampler for four mana that comes into play tapped and doesn't untap unless you cast a uh, Historic spell. Um, Voltaic Servant is its best yeah. friend, right? Voltaic Servant lets it untap every turn, basically. Uh you also, you know, speaking of rare artifacts, a uh, Helm of the Host is a card most people, including myself, misread, and you get to keep the token forever. Mm -hmm. So you, yep. you should just, be, well, first of all, this card's great. It's just one of the better cards in the set. Second, it, it can get really filthy if you're putting it on enter the battlefield effect creature or, or a creature that does something when it dies because you will still get like a 1-1 token when your Death Bloom Thalad dies. Yeah, totally. And the thing about this card that just stood out to me and what I wanted to put on here is that it's like every question you have of it, it gives you what you want, right? Like you put it on your creature and you're like, you know, it'd be nice if I had the creature now rather than like at the beginning of my upkeep or at my end step. And it's like, sure, we'll do it at the beginning of combat. Okay, I got the creature now. Uh, I want to attack with it though. Sure, we'll give it haste. No problem, right? It's like, well, what if I want to put it on a legendary creature? They're like, yeah, we'll just erase that a legendary part. Like, well, okay, this is great. I don't want to sacrifice it at the end of turn. And Helmut Host is like, no problem. You can just keep it. It's like, what the, like everything I've asked for, it's given me. And then I'm like, okay, fine. I put it on, I make a token, my opponent kills my Helm of the Host things. I surely can't put it on the token and then start making copies of that, right? Like there has to be the word non-token on here. Nope, you can just do it. So anything basically that you would think would be like the gotcha moment for this card isn't there. So it's just extremely powerful. You do have to be a little careful with how much mana you put into it if you're under pressure, but boy, it pays so, you so back. Your tip right and way. trick there was to read Helm of the Host. Indeed. Yeah. Well, carefully. Yeah. I, I, did, I, I will say I did get it wrong. When I first Some, something I did not do. Yeah. Uh, right away. So this is a play that we talked about on the show early, but it's one to keep in mind. This is against Evra Halcyon yeah. Witness. This is before the giving her link. minus four minus zero in response yeah. to switching life totals will, will kill the opposing player. That's right. So what happens is, is they say, I want to switch life totals. They pay the four mana that goes on the stack. Then you say, I want to befuddle Evra. And if you do so, uh, Ever's light, uh, Ever's power will become zero when the befuddle resolves, and then the other ability will resolve, and uh, their life total will then become zero. And when that happens, they lose the game. So the one thing that they can do um, is they can switch it back again in response, though it gets kind of funny because then their life total becomes four because <laughs> they're doing it with all of these things on the stack, and uh, ostensibly Ever's uh, power is still four. So you can still get some work done. Um, they may be able to attack you or whatever, but if they do have eight mana, then they won't die. But anyway, that's just one to keep in mind. Um, this is one that comes up uh, every time we have cards like this, but you can catch Gideon's Reproach after combat, but before the second main phase. So this is after damage has happened. There's a step called the damage step. This is where damage actually occurs. It happens at the beginning of this step, but any attacking or blocking creatures are still considered attacking or blocking by the game during this time, making uh, them legal just, targets. Why do you want to do this? If if you're getting attacked by you know, mm -hmm. the 7-6 Primordial Worm and you have a 2-2, two -two, if you cast Reproach before damage, your opponent could then be like, okay, I'll even fire your 2-2. Two -two. You want to let damage happen mm -hmm. in this case and then cast Gideon's Reproach because you locked in your creature mm -hmm. dealing damage. So, it, it, Yeah, and and your creature was going to die either and way. So, and it's yeah. something worth considering uh, doing e even when in spots where like maybe if you were approached before damage, then 
you would take less damage, but this rules out a combat trick. Like you, you have a, you know, like a complicated combat and your instinct is to approach before damage. Sometimes you just want to flush out combat tricks and you take a little bit of extra damage and then see that they don't have that. And then you cast against your approach. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Uh, cool combo. If you do happen to be in the red white deck, Quende pride of Femoreth plus, plus warlords fury equals all of your creatures uh, get double strike. Jousting Lance turn. also a really so. good friend of Quende and dub. Like, <laughs> there's actually just a lot of ways to give first strike in this format and a lot of creatures that kind of randomly have it. One pro tip, your yeah. disciple, the one on flyer that gets plus muscle when you play a historic spell, it has first strike. It, no, no one ever knows that. I, I've seen millions of three ones does, get yeah. attacked into it. Uh, another card that has a lot of tricky stuff going on is Time of Ice, the saga that taps down two creatures then bounces all tapped creatures. So no, mm -hmm. you can respond to the last trigger by tapping a creature with something like Icy Manipulator or Merfolk Trickster. Also, yep. it bounces your own tapped creatures, so you could do, you know, either tap your creatures for an effect or play something that'll tap your own creature if there's something you want to bounce. And there's a nice little loop with uh, Rona, the artificer that exiles a historic card from your graveyard. Before Time of Ice goes off, you pay four and tap Rona to exile your top card, and then Time of Ice bounces Rona. Then you play Rona, exile Time of Ice, replay Time of Ice, and you can just keep keep doing Ooh. this. I like that. Infinite Time so, of Ice, yeah. so that's nice. Time of Ice got a lot going uh, That's really yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. um you can yeah this one <laughs> this, this one deep, i think but well, you can steal <laughs> yeah you can steal a cold water snapper within bolus's clutches now this one comes from tbs who we've had on the show a few times and he posted a picture on twitter uh basically the way you do this is you have to resolve in bolus's clutches on something else and then you have to blink it with sentinels of the pearl trident and then attach it to the big turtle yeah that, that's amazing it's kind of an achievement unlocked, right? <laughs> it, it is very good. Uh, it's basically in Volus's Clutches is a lot of weird stuff. I already mentioned on the show about how if they take your creature with clutches, you should clutches their clutches so that all the clutches die to legendary, the legend roll, or their clutches die to mm -hmm. legend roll, then yours go away because there's nothing on them. And this is just another, another piece of weirdness involving uh, that, that particular aura. Yeah, it is a strange one. Uh, we talked about this one before, but it just as a reminder, uh, you know, you can target an attacking creature with Merfolk Trickster after it's been declared as an attacker, but before blockers so that it'll lose any abilities like flying or first strike, and then you can block it profitably. Most people just default to tapping down a creature before attacks because they think, well, that way it can't attack me. But there are times when you actually want to have the creature attacking so that you can block it and kill it. You know, if they've got what we've been talking about, Quende, if they got Quende, you know, let them attack, then play the Merfolk Trickster targeting Quende, and then just trade off your Trickster for Quende. And you're like, hooray, right? Like, I got rid of this really annoying permanent. And uh, that can be yeah. really important. Another cool trick, uh, Four Bears Blade, the plus three plus O Vigilance Trample equipment that when the equipped creature dies, you get to re-equip the blade. Mondo Combo mm -hmm. Sacrifice Effects. I, I killed someone out of nowhere with Thalid Omnivore because I attacked with the Omnivore. Ooh. They blocked with the 1-1. I sacked the creature that had the blade. All of a sudden, the, the omnivore is wearing the blade. Then I eat two more creatures and just, you know. He, 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 oh, my 12. God. So It was 12? Oh, my God. That is sweet. Uh, I another love that. weird thing with Four Bears Blade, if they attack you and have the blade on one of their creatures, you really don't want to block that creature with a first striking creature. Because likewise, no. <laughs> you'll toss the blade onto something else, and then it, that creature will deal damage. Before damage. You, yeah, yeah. I've never even so seen this, good. but I guess you, the, the logical extension is – you could Sheevan fire your own creature to move the blade or something along those lines. Yes. <laughs> if it was lethal, yeah. yeah, you totally could. Like that is extremely unintuitive, but it is a spot that could come up and win you a game. So keep it in mind. Um, Naru Meha, this is the copy ability. I just wanted to go over this for people that aren't used to this because it's kind of a weird card. So the way it works is uh, it says when it enters the battlefield, you can copy uh, an instant or sorcery that you control and choose new targets for the copy. But it's like, how do I, how does that actually work? And the way it works is you put an instant or sorcery on the stack. Then while it's still on the stack, you say, I don't want it to resolve yet. I have another effect or whatever. You cast Narumeha. And if she resolves, you'll get a triggered ability targeting that spell that you already control on the stack. When that triggered ability resolves, you'll get a copy of the spell that you can choose the new targets for, and that's how that works. So you need a lot of mana. If you're casting a three mana spell that you want to copy, you're going to need seven mana total to be able to do that. It's not easy to do, 
Um, it's often worth it to just run Narumeha out beforehand. But if you do find yourself in a late game scenario, that's how you do it. If you happen to be on Magic Online, the way to hold priority to not say, uh, let my spell resolve that I've put on there is to hold down the control button on your computer. Um, you can tap artifacts to cast Zahid Jinn of the Lamp. He can be the Jinn of the Jousting Lance or Jinn of the Short Sword or, you know. J J yeah, Th these are uh, artifacts that you don't normally yeah. tap, right? Like equipment. Equi I mean, like or whatever. equipment, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so just keep that in mind that, that it can be any random artifact or an artifact You also tap on a Juggernaut so you're not forced to attack with it that turn. Oh, there you go. Hey, that's um, sweet. Uh, this one's a nice one too. This next one, I, I know I've seen you do this type of play uh, multiple times, um, not in this set, but I've seen you do it before, which is kind of forcing a card into your opponent's hand when you're going to cast a discard spell anyway. In this set, it can come up with like a bounce spell on their end. Like let's say your opponent has one card in their hand and they've got a bomb. You can bounce that bomb back to their hand, leaving them with two cards and then untap and kick Caligo's Skin Witch to get both of them. Um, you can also do this with uh, Ergaros, the empty one. If if it's just one card, you can say end step, bounce your well, Lyra. Or if you're feeling lucky uh, since Ergaros is random, just ba bounce into their four card. Oh, yeah, and just, just, just like... Hey, <laughs> look, that, that happens too, right? Like if you can't beat it any other way, that you so, might just want to take your 25%. Um, one of the things I dislike about having a card like Caligo Skin Witch in the format is and, uh, whenever I'm playing against black at all points, so I'm like, what, what happens if they play Skin Witch next turn? So like... It's yeah. like holding two yeah. lands the whole game, or sometimes you're like, okay, I want to play my last two cards, be empty handed in case they play Skin Witch. So just keep it in mind. The general defense is to hold two cards you don't need to protect your good cards, uh, but you're not always going to be able to do that. Yeah. So just make that judgment call as you go. Um, Drudge Sentinel is a card that doesn't see that much play. So, and hopefully you probably shouldn't play it, but if you do end up playing it, uh, it is weirdly templated as far as the rules text goes. And this is worth taking a minute to talk about because you can learn a lesson about it. It's weird, but the key comes, when does the colon, the two dots come uh, in the line of text? Because every single text box that has an activated ability has something, then a colon, and then something else. And everything before the colon is considered the cost for the effect. So it's what you have to pay. And everything after the colon is what you get. And so in this case, it's kind of weird because it's actually pay three mana, colon, tap sentinel, and it gets indestructible. And that's weird because we're used to pay three mana, tap sentinel, colon, it gets indestructible. That's not what this is. That means that um, you can you can be attacking and it will say, okay, I want to tap this. Well, well it's tap, it doesn't matter. Better, so this yeah. would have been a useful trick, but yeah. I... Yeah. <laughs> But but it is useful in general because people need to know how to how to read the cost and effect thing to understand when each thing happens and what you're well, actually paying for. This is also magic why templating is a skill. Ahead. It's one of the least yeah. uh, fun and interesting parts about magic, in my opinion. Like, I mean, okay. what you're saying right now is important. Like, you will win more matches over the course of your career if you like understand how these things work. But this is you're kind of bummed that you have to know that. This is just not an exciting thing to tell someone. Like, I'm deeply invested in magic. Like you're like, all right, stuff. listen, here's where the colon is. And the things that happened before yeah. are the cost. And the things that happened afterwards are the effect. And I'm just thinking, like, that's not as cool as, like, <laughs> learning that green shotguns are better than orange ones or vice versa in Fortnite. You know? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, no, you're, you're, I mean, look, for me, I love this stuff. So I'm like, no, this is kind of interesting, but like zooming out like half of a step, I, I see your point. It's, it's a little in the weeds. Is, uh, look, we're, we're, we're and I did, by the way, say in, in our the notes. weeds on um, things. And, and this is, yeah. you know, a lot of people listen to the podcast do too. And th this is what you listen for, this kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah. which is, <laughs> No, but you are right. Where, where does the cold? Yeah. I, I was just struck by that when when we were because we were talking about you know comparing basketball to magic yeah. and like you know yeah. strategic fouling in basketball. I guess is the closest strategy. it gets. Where it's like, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, well, yeah. it's pretty lame that they decide just to foul someone over and it's over awful. again to send them to the free throw line. But in it, any case, it's sad. Uh, if you play Torgar, you can target yourself and knock your own life total up to ten. If also, yeah, that's right. So if you find yourself down below at an uncomfortable life ability. total, you can If gain. your opponent is at six and you're at 15, I would suggest not using the ability because it's not profitable on either side. Oh, is it? Is it a May? 
Oh, did not realize um, that. I thought you had it. Oh, this next one is a card I played with a bunch because it's quite good. Haphazard Bombardment, I think, is really living up to uh, my expectations of it. You know, we, we, we liked it in this review. Mm -hmm. Its aim counters persist. So what you can do with, like, a card like, say, Rescue or Blink, Blink of an Eye, you play Bombardment, you whittle down their permanence, then you bounce Bombardment and replay it. It'll go all the way down to just to a one aim counter. So that is pretty sweet. So you get to add four to... Four to new things, and the one that remained will still be there, and then yeah. you get to start chipping downwards again. Yeah, oh, this so next there's one's a little really bit of extra point. I, I actually didn't know this until now. I see, look, we're both learning from this. Oh, yeah, for sure. So this next one is on Rampaging Cyclops. So it says that it gets minus two, minus zero um, whenever it's being blocked by two creatures, but it's only for as long as there's two creatures blocking it, which means if they put, for example, two three threes in front of it, but you kill one before damage happens, it'll actually grow back up to a four four and yeah, eat that, the that's remaining something three three. I've gotten got by. Yeah, and it's not a uh, – it's you know, because I think that, you, you know, you might assume that it's like a triggered ability or something along those lines, uh, but it's not. So once that yeah, situation changes – As long as you know where the colon is on the ability, then like you, you are good to go. <laughs> then he, he sees clearly <laughs> and uh, we'll get you. Um, Garna the Blood Flame, very flexible card. It's, it's strange for a black-red card to have as many kind of virtual modes as Garna does, but she does have a lot. And one of them, just a simple one to keep in mind is that – uh, if you end up with a ton of mana and you mill yourself, you can get the, the creatures back that went there. And one of the easiest ways to do it, again, you do need a lot of mana and you need nine mana to do this. But if you play Dark Bargain, you know, you can afford to put a creature in the graveyard and take the other two cards and then play Garner the Blood Flame that turn and get back the creature. Now, again, it's a corner case because of how much mana you need. But these things do pop up sometimes and uh, you want to make sure you're not leaving any value. Another cool combo with Garner is uh, Whisper. You sack two creatures to get Garner back out of your graveyard. Garna immediately is like, you know, ship those creatures back and, and you get them back into your hand. So. Ooh, yeah, that's a lot of value right there. <laughs> Juggernaut um, can't this is be kind blocked of, by creatures yeah. that have deep freeze on them because they are a wall. And we all know the Juggernaut can't be blocked by walls. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. This actually came up with the GP this weekend in Dallas. And the crazy part about it is that I was in the booth with uh, Paulo and he just snapped it off. Like, I had, look, I know that it becomes uh, a defender. But I didn't – I wasn't sure if they would actually change the creature type to wall because that isn't really a popular thing to do these days. But it does. It, it totally turns it into a wall. And Paulo's like, that's an illegal block. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Look at him. Like, he's right. It's a wall. You just can't do that. And we were able to uh, – to, to interrupt them before it got out of hand. So remember that you know key interaction in the format. Um, one of these came up for me. Uh, just as a thing to look at, uh, always look at your draw step before resolving Song of Fraley's final chapter, because if you're running Spore Swarm, you might want to cast it in response to that uh, last trigger and get those plus one, plus one counters on the three extras. I actually did this. I didn't look, and then I looked at the card after. This is the first time I played oh, with yeah. the, uh, This is the pre-release, but I'm just like, oh my god. Like I could have just cast this and gotten free counters on these guys, and I just... Yeah. I, Hadn't figured Likewise, out how the you, mechanics work. You have the Eldest Reborn about to, to, to proc, which gets a creature back from the graveyard. You can, during your draw step, before the ability goes in the stack, because once it goes in the stack, you target, but before it goes in the stack, um, use something like Urza's Tome or Dark Bargain or a kill spell to, to put it in a better target in the graveyard. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Um, Another one that's pretty straightforward, but just people can get tricked up on a little bit is Fire Fist Adept, uh, uh, its ability. This is one that we talked about a, uh, a little bit ago with the Blue Red Wizards deck. It's the four and a red three three. It does damage uh, equal to the number of wizards you control to uh, a creature, your, it's to any creature. And uh, maybe it's, it's actually to your opponents that your opponents control, I think. But anyway, um, it's when it resolves. So if you cast it with three total wizards and you target a three toughness creature and your opponent kills one of your wizards with the ability on the stack, the ability will still happen. That's not that's not changing, but it will count how many wizards uh, upon resolution and you, the creature will only take two damage rather than three. So it, if you have two roughly equal creatures, but once, you know, let's say you have three wizards, including the fire fist adept, but one's two toughness and one's three toughness, and your opponent has a bunch of mana available. You might want to play it a little safe and take out the two toughness yeah, one just best. in case they interrupt the process. Uh, speaking of yeah, Rona, like, you can you can kick cards that you're casting with Rona because you're casting them just like, you know, a normal, a normal casting. Yep. 
So you can absolutely play kicker and all that. And then the last one we had uh, was a card that you and I talked about a little uh, last week, I believe. Mirari, Mirari's Conjecture. The Mirari Conjecture, it's called. That's the one um, that lets you get back a, an instant and then a sorcery and then uh, lets you double, you know, copy any instants and sorceries you play after Chapter 3 goes. But the th key thing is that I have seen people um, assume that it's only the cards that they've gotten back or something. It's anything. So you're really incentivized to wait for that turn to cast the things that you got back plus anything else you might have in your hand because you could turn, you know, uh, uh, some of those divinations or removal spells into kill two things, draw four cards or whatever, and, and it's going to be pretty tough to come back from that. So just I think that the the way to play the Marari Conjecture is to absolutely plan around that Chapter 3 turn and sandbag whatever you can get away with until you get it because uh, if you plan that turn out correctly – you're going to be able to generate enough advantage to destroy sure. the game. All right, that's going to do it. Um, so hopefully helpful for you uh, to get into these archetypes that we've really liked and then also some of these little corner cases and, and interesting rules and tricks and stuff that have popped up in the format. Um, I want to remind you that Limited Resources is brought to you proudly by channelfireball.com each and every week. Uh, we thank them for their support of the show, and uh, it's, it's certainly helpful to us if you go to Channel Fireball and check out what they have to offer. Uh, we know you won't be disappointed. They've got a full selection of singles and sealed product and everything you need to, to keep fueling your magic passion. And then also while you're there, free content that helps you just get better at magic. And we know that's why you're here, and that's a great thing that you can pick up at, at Channel Fireball for absolutely free. And, uh, you know, they're part of the reason why we offer the show for free as well. Um, so thank you to Channel Fireball. And uh, we hope you can check them out. If you want to find us on social media, I am Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com, including ways to connect with us and uh, things to see as far as uh, Luis's stream. Luis, I saw you were streaming uh, last week. And, you know, you can find all that kind of stuff, uh, links to it and everything right on the front page of LRcast.com. That's going to do it for the show this week. Got kind of a special one brewed up uh, for the old uh, 4 for one next week. We'll see you then. So it's pretty early in the format, but I've already found myself falling for a particular trap. And, you know, this is what you, I guess in poker you call a leak, right? This is something, mm -hmm. a, a oh, yeah. place where you lose value and you know it's like one of your weaknesses. And I definitely have one. It's the legendary spells. You know, Karn's Temporal Sundering, Jaya's Inferno, Yawgmoth's Vile Offering. I, I just can't resist Taking them and feeling like, look, I'll be able to pick up enough legends. I, I'll definitely get there. And then, then at the yeah. and then you end yeah, up with I, I either leave them in my sideboard because I have two at the end of the draft, or I play them with like three or four, and I'm splashing one of those legends, and it just doesn't quite get there. And don't get me wrong, these cards are good, but I know for sure that I take them higher than I should, especially like later in the pack. Like it's mid pack two. That Karn Temporal Sundering is looking pretty good though, because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm a natural optimist. I tend to think things are going to work out. That's just, you know, I, I find that a useful approach to life. I actually think it's good, but I mean, whatever. That, that is just the, the position I'm coming from. That that leads me into trouble in a lot of places, and this is one of them, where I just see these cards and I just can't help but think of like the best case scenario. And in this case, that's just casting it, but that's a tall order for some of these cards. Definitely. So I think it's really interesting to look, and it's not usually this apparent. Usually leaks are harder to spot. This one, I just know. I just like, I can see it in myself. And, the, you know, it reminds me of another perfect trap card in the set, Navigator's Compass, <laughs> which pe people are still not oh, giving yeah. up the fight there. And nope. it just makes me think like w when you're lucky enough to, to see your leaks, at, you know, r right in front of you, that, that means you can actually do something about it because there's plenty of leaks you just never see. Like, you know, there's things you know, right? You, you know, like, I like ice cream too much. That's definitely a leak. <laughs> like, you know, there, oh, there, know. There, there, there's a lot of them that are apparent, but there's a lot that you, you don't see, and that's, that's those are the really dangerous ones. So I think it's worth examining draft and not drafts, just anything, uh, to try to spot your leaks and, and try to plug those holes because, man, I, 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 all I want to do is cast Karn's Temporal Sundering, and I know I'm losing matches as a result. Yeah, well, the, I think you're doing the hard part, by the way, is, is recognizing oh, yeah. them. Like addressing them is 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 not easy either, but seeing well, the mistakes it you don't see are the way more dangerous ones. And this was just one that it just mm -hmm. really stood out to me. I thought that was interesting. It doesn't usually it doesn't usually feel that way. Do you have any uh, leaks that you, you know right now? Um. Well, I found myself uh, falling into the age old trap of of sort of drafting the same 
like pick it, first picking the same cards over and over again and not really pushing into other areas. That's actually what led me to that red right, white right. deck was that I just hadn't really played the format or, or play that archetype. And I just felt like I keep ending up in these like green, black, green, blue, you know, these kind of decks that I like with the kind of cards that I like. But I'm just like, I need to figure out if these other things are good. So I've been trying to address it. But I think if you looked at a snapshot of the decks I've been drafting, I'm probably too too far skewed towards the the types of decks that I want to play and, and not really experimenting enough with that. And then uh, over-reliance on Dredge Sentinels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>